This hearing will come to order. Good afternoon. Welcome to this Research and Science Education Subcommittee hearing on coordination of international science partnerships. Last year, the subcommittee, then led by Dr. Baird, held two hearings on the topic of international science and technology cooperation, one on the role of federal agencies, including the Office of Science and Technology Policy, and the second on the role of non-governmental organizations, including universities. Dr. Baird, Dr. Ehlers, and Mr. Carnahan also hosted a roundtable here in the committee room and participated in a workshop hosted by the American Association for the Advancement of Science. I want to thank Dr. Baird for making international cooperation a priority for the subcommittee. I concur with him that the new administration gives us a tremendous opportunity and a fresh outlook for both science and foreign policy. We have a chance to take advantage of our preeminence in science and technology to strengthen diplomatic ties, help ensure that decision makers around the world have access to the best scientific advice, and leverage other countries' resources to tackle common challenges in energy, climate, water resources, and health. While the hearings last year included broad conversations about the value and importance of science and technology cooperation to our economic and national security, today we will focus on the practical mechanisms for coordinating such activities across the federal government, including between the technical agencies and the State Department. In particular, we're going to examine a legislative proposal that would create a committee to coordinate U.S. participation in international S&T partnerships and identify partnerships at the intersection of our nation's S&T and foreign policy missions. In the 1990s, there was such a committee known as the Committee on International Science, Engineering, and Technology, or CISIT. CISIT existed within the National Science and Technology Council, which is managed by OSTP, it is the main interagency coordinating body for federal R&T activities. CISIT had three main goals. First, it was tasked to identify and coordinate international cooperation that could strengthen the domestic S&T enterprise and promote U.S. economic competitiveness and national security. Second, CISIT also helped utilize American leadership in S&T to address global issues and to support the post-Cold War tenets of U.S. foreign policy, promoting democracy, maintaining peace, and fostering economic growth and sustainable development. Finally, CISA helped coordinate the international aspects of federal R&D funding across federal agencies. President Bush's OSTP director chose to disband CISA in favor of a distributed approach to coordination of international activities, either subsumed within issue area committees under NSTC or convened in response to a call from the State Department to work with a specific country. But such, ad, such an ad hoc distributed approach almost certainly missed opportunities for the State Department and technical agencies to identify and engage in partnerships of mutual interest. I'm very happy that the new OSTP director, Dr. Holdren, has indicated his intention to appoint an associate director for national security and international affairs at OSTP a position his predecessor dismissed is unnecessary. But the legislation we are discussing today would also ask Dr. Holdren to go a step further in asserting a leadership role for OSDP in international S&T cooperation by reconstituting a Committee on International Science, Engineering, and Technology under NTS, NSTC. The witnesses before us today have extensive experience and personal experience with interagency coordination for international S&T, and I look forward to their comments on our legislative proposal. In particular, we want to make sure that CISIT has a unique purpose and role relative to subject area committees within NSTC, that it effectively engages both the technical agencies and the Department of State, and that it can serve an important function even without new money for international partnerships. I want to thank all the witnesses for taking the time to appear before the committee this afternoon, and I look forward to your testimony. The chair now recognizes Dr. Ehlers for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this hearing. It's a very important topic. As a scientist, uh, I've been a very strong supporter of international cooperation in uh, science and, and if I may call it that, diplomacy or foreign, foreign affairs for many, many years. 
In fact, when I got my PhD, uh, I proceeded to spend a year in Europe studying and getting to know the culture and the science there. The, uh, I was also a very strong supporter uh, at the very early stages of cooperation with the Soviet Union. And uh, as we all know by now, that was one of the key factors in breaking open the doors of the Soviet Union, not only to scientists, but to many others. Uh, you can imagine my surprise when I came to the Congress and was asked to write a science policy statement in which I intended to include uh, issues related to this and discovered that the State Department no longer even had anyone in the realm of, of science within their walls. And uh, fortunately, uh, Dr. Newrider uh, was willing to step into the breach there as, as I put some pressure on them. And that was a start of, of greater things. And I appreciate you being here, Dr. Newrider, and, and thank you also for what you did at that time. Identifying and coordinating activities within the federal government which mutually benefit our scient scientific enterprise and our foreign policy goals is a valuable mission, and therefore I very strongly support the, the uh, goals of this legislation. I know all of our witnesses seek to inform this committee re uh, regarding the most efficient way to achieve these common goals, and I greatly appreciate their expertise and reflection on this topic. In the last Congress, this subcommittee held a series of three hearings on issues related to science and diplomacy. From the uh, esoteric to the mundane, which is how do we get visas for foreign scientists and how do we uh, work with the State Department to accomplish these goals, especially given the new restrictions after 9-11. Uh, we have seen only glimpses of the power behind leveraging these two communities because the commitment to do so has not been sustained, focused, or well organized. Individual scientists who have partnered with peers in other nations would unequivocally assure you that such partnerships have been good for U.S. science, despite the fact that their motivation for such a partnership was probably purely based on discovery. I look forward to learning from our witnesses today about the proposal before us and how we would make it stronger, and I certainly thank you for your attendance. Uh, let, me, let me add just one more personal note. Uh, my son is a geophysicist and uh, was at the University of Michigan uh, in teaching and doing research. He uh, discovered a German counterpart who was interested in very similar experiments, and they uh, immediately developed ideas for a cooperative relationship. Uh, the German government was very cooperative and provided funding for them to work together. And my son was unable to get a research grant in the United States for the same purpose. Uh, ironically, he has now accepted a position at a university in Germany. So a uh, reverse brain drain, or maybe a real brain drain, uh, but certainly a loss of uh, contact with my son. So it's clear we have a ways to go in the United States, and uh, I, I hope we will be able to resolve these problems. Thank you very much, and I yield back. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ehlers. As, as usual, you have a tremendous amount of uh, knowledge and experience uh, to, to add uh, here at this, this hearing today. So if there are members who wish to submit additional opening statements, your statements will be added to the record at this point. And at this time, I'd like to introduce our witnesses. Dr. John C. Strauss is the chairman of the National Science Board Task Force on International Science, which produced the 2008 report, International Science and Engineering Partnerships, a priority for U.S. foreign policy and our nation's innovation enterprise. Dr. Norman P. Newrider is the director of the Center for Science, Technology, and Security Policy, American Association for the Advancement of Science. Mr. Anthony Bud Rock is the vice president for global engagement at Arizona State University. We had a fourth witness, uh, Dr. Gerald Hani, the managing director of Q Paradigm, but unfortunately he is not able to make it here this afternoon, he apparently is uh, uh, stuck in, uh, in Tokyo because of the unfortunate plane crash there yesterday. So he's not able to join us, but Dr. Hani's testimony will be submitted for the record. Members will have the opportunity to follow up with written questions. As our witnesses should know, you will each have five minutes for your spoken testimony. Your written testimony will be included in the record for the hearing. 
When all of you have completed your spoken testimony, we will begin with questions. Each member will have five minutes to question the panel. So with our witnesses, we will start with Dr. Strauss. Well, Chairman Lipinski, Ranking Member Ellers, and members of the subcommittee, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is John Strauss. I'm president of Bainbridge Graduate Institute in the state of Washington. I'm also a member of the National Science Board and appear before you today in my role as chairman of the board's former task force on international science. Thank you for this opportunity to testify on the important topic of science diplomacy. The board task force on international science was established in September of 2005, broadly examined international science and engineering partnerships. The resulting report International Science and Engineering Partnerships, a priority for U.S. foreign policy, our nation's innovation enterprise, offers a series of recommendations on supporting international science and engineering partnerships as a tool to strengthen efforts in international diplomacy. The task force recommendations were developed after extensive formal and informal discussions with scientists and engineers from around the world. Over the last few years, international coordination among federal entities has been conducted primarily on an ad hoc basis. One of the key recommendations in the board's report is the reestablishment of the National Science and Technology Council, NSTC, Committee on International Science, Engineering, and Technology, CISET. The board believes a reconstituted CISET would serve to coordinate the activities of the various federal science agencies and ensure a coherent, integrated, and strong U.S. international science strategy. An example of creating collaborations across borders and organizational boundaries comes from the Partnerships for International Research and Education, PIRE, program in the NSF's Office of International Science and Engineering. While PIRE coordinates international research efforts across the entire spectrum of the NSF disciplines, similar activities could readily be coordinated and leveraged across the federal government through the NSTC CISET Committee. The global nature of many long-standing science challenges, such as epidemics, natural disasters, and the search for alternative energy sources, makes it critical for scientists and engineers from around the world to collaborate in addressing issues that cross geographic and national boundaries. Successful international science partnerships are critical to overcoming such global challenges. Science diplomacy can advance international relations in U.S. foreign policy efforts around the world. Science and engineering, with its common language, methods, and values, has helped to initiate and to reinforce positive relations between peoples and nations with historic and deep-seated enmities. These partnerships contribute to building more stable relations among communities and nations based on commonly accepted scientific values of objectivity, sharing, integrity, and free inquiry. For science diplomacy to succeed, it is critical that the federal government expand efforts to coordinate science and engineering activities across all federal agencies through a reconstituted CISET. Improving the national capabilities of developing countries stands to benefit all participants and advance U.S. diplomacy. NSF has recently signed a Memorandum of Understanding with the U.S. Agency for International Development to coordinate broadly scoped research and higher education initiatives in which NSF supports U.S. researchers and USAID supports science and engineering capacity building in developing countries. Efforts between individual agencies such as this MOU would be greatly strengthened through an overall coordinating committee. Since 1950, when President Truman convened the first meeting of the National Science Board, the board has worked to fulfill our mission to the nation to promote the progress of science, to advance the national health, prosperity, and welfare, and to secure the national defense. The President has clearly demonstrated his commitment to science and engineering and spoken of the importance of science in domestic and international policy. On behalf of the National Science Board and our Chairman, Dr. Stephen Beering, I want to thank the subcommittee for its support regarding our policy recommendations and for the important work it does for the United States scientific research, education, and training. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my formal remarks. Thank you, Dr. Strauss. Now I recognize uh, Dr. Newrider for five minutes. Chairman Lipinski, Dr. Ehlers, members of the subcommittee, thank you very much for inviting me. As an unabashed zealot. Is your microphone on? Let's <laughs> reset the clock. As an unabashed zealot for the value of international S&T cooperation, both to science and to foreign policy, I commend you for this hearing, and I applaud the interest 
of the subcommittee on this topic. In some 45 years of working in international science and business, I have seen how international S&T cooperation can be a very effective instrument of non-political, soft power engagement and a key element of a constructive foreign policy. At AAAS, we call this science diplomacy in action. Furthermore, solving present global challenges such as climate change, energy, health, food, clean water, and so on, demand both the application of S&T and cooperation among many nations to do the necessary research. This cooperation is a double winner. It solves problems and it builds relationships. However, present mechanisms for U.S. response to these opportunities and challenges are, in my view, inadequate. In the new structure of the National Security Council, OSTP, and the State Department, SISET can mitigate these shortcomings. I support your proposal to reestablish SISET through legislation as the government's focal point for international S&T. This bill will send a powerful message to the agencies about congressional interest in this subject. The proposed reporting mechanism will maintain an important record of progress. It is critical that OSTP be fully integrated into the NSC process of foreign policy decision-making with close ties to the science units of the State Department, the OES bureaus <coughs> in state, uh, and the OES bureau and the science advisor. SISET must also have top quality staffing from the NSTC and authoritative membership from all of the federal agencies involved. I do, however, caution against an international negotiating role for SISET, and I distinguish between its proper role of setting technical priorities while deferring to state in the NSC on political or country priorities. Once priorities are set and agency players identified, planning the projects and negotiating with the foreign partners must be left to the agencies with appropriate State Department guidance. Now, one other word of caution, I urge the subcommittee to make its intentions absolutely clear, namely that the role of SISET is to foster mutually beneficial cooperation and not to create another security gate of export controls and visa barriers that will worsen an already serious problem, eloquently described in the recent NAS report, Beyond Fortress America. My last point is perhaps the most important. I implore this subcommittee to begin the process of establishing a dedicated governmental fund for the conduct of high-priority international S&T cooperation. I know you're not appropriators, but I urge you to, to do whatever you can to start that process. Do what a scientist or engineer would do. Run a test. Run an experiment. Help put some money into the foreign affairs budget for the State Department, not for USAID, because we do not want to project an image of foreign assistance. We want to cooperate with respected partners who will very often pay their own way in the projects. We are talking cooperation, not assistance. These funds would be distributed in two ways. For science diplomacy initiatives, the money would go to NSF, which would use it for agreed projects with countries designated by state along with OSTP and NSF. NSF can then extend grants to universities, appropriate NGOs, or make transfers to technical agencies. Another portion of the money would be used for distribution to federal agencies to complement their relevant domestic programs and make possible the desired links to international cooperation. Often agencies cannot justify such expenditures from their domestic budgets, and I think that's critical. SISED would have a major role in defining the projects. The money will motivate agency participation. It will give SISED a special focus, and it will make SISED a key adjunct to OSTP's vital domestic role of guiding the U.S. S&T enterprise. Moreover, seeing that internationally the OSTP director is, in effect, the U.S. Minister for Science, a reinvigorated SISED will provide a well-crafted portfolio for him to carry around the world. And when the President of the United States goes to another country and, as a deliverable, proposes an agreement for S&T cooperation, the U.S. will finally be able to do more than pass the cup to already stressed agencies in order to cobble up a reasonable response. In conclusion, your SISET proposal can provide an exciting new way for the U.S. to reach out to the world. Using S&T, we, we will be solving problems and building relationships 
noble goals that would be hailed both at home and abroad. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Newrider, with the extra uh, 10 seconds there. You came right in at the, at the five minutes. <laughs> Thank you. It really and bothered me. I'm sorry. <laughs> I recognize Mr. Rock now for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and distinguished members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today to speak on this important topic. Mr. Chairman, global advances in science and technology have positioned us better than ever before to address the challenges and the opportunities that we face as a nation and as a planet. In, in my remarks today, I'd like to refer very briefly to what I call the core principles or reasons for, for uh, our international science uh, collaboration and, and in talking about the mechanisms within the executive branch to coordinate national R&D priorities. I'd like to discuss the strengths and, and the weaknesses of the former uh, NSTC uh, Committee on International Science, Engineering, and Technology. Mr. Chairman, I, I support the intent of the, of the draft legislation to reestablish this international committee, but I would urge that the reconstituted committee take particular responsibility for four essential areas. First, to help strengthen the international aspects of the so-called national R&D cross-cut priorities that are defined annually in the President's budget submission. Second, to reinforce and strengthen the mandates of the federal agencies themselves to undertake international R&D. Third, to ensure senior level engagement in international science and technology collaboration that most advances our foreign policy objectives. And fourth, I do uh, I think that the committee should advise in the establishment and in the administration of a new global science fund to enable the federal agencies and the broader scientific community, notably universities, to participate more productively in this, in this enterprise. Very briefly, the core principles for international science collaboration, something that I call the four Ds, are, are for discovery, that universal quest for human understanding, for diplomacy, the recognition that these partnerships and this cooperation are expressions of broader trust and mutual respect, for decision making, to ensure that governments and individuals make decisions that are rooted in, in objectivity and informed exchange, and for development, to be sure that the tools of knowledge are working for those in greatest need and to help those to strive to make even greater achievements. Within the government, the 1976 uh, act that authorized OSTP to lead the interagency process also called upon OSTP to engage the private sector, engage the state and local governments, engage the higher education communities, and engage other nations toward this end. And similarly, to advise the president on the, uh, the uh, domestic and international implications of science and technology. When CISIT was established, it focused on coordination and it focused particularly on the cross-cut areas uh, across the uh, issues that cross agency boundaries. Mr. Chairman, each year the NSTC works with federal agencies and departments to identify a set of R&D areas that require coordinated investment across agencies and, and special attention in the, in the President's budget, the so-called cross-cut issues. A reconstituted and a revitalized CISIT should first and foremost be assigned the lead responsibility to define the international dimensions of these national cross-cuts and the related areas of special emphasis. In the past, CISIT has struggled with this mission. They've often been overlooked in that coordinating role. Instead, the NSTC committees that address these critical areas generally prefer to work within their own member agencies of the committee and overlook the role that CISIT can play in this, in this function. I think this has exposed several weaknesses. I think that the international as aspects have not received sufficient attention, and I think that when they are identified, they are not translated over to the agencies that can follow through on them, the Department of State, AID, uh, and others. Mr. Chairman, I think that CISIT should also provide thorough review and analysis that can support the explicit and expanded mandates and resources for federal agencies themselves to engage in international research for U.S. interests. Again, CISIT has struggled to add value to the international issues in the R&D budget process for the federal agencies themselves. These two measures, taking the lead in defining the international dimensions of our national research priorities and supporting the resource, resource commitments of the federal agencies alone, will inspire the agencies themselves to seek broader research uh, horizons and engage more actively in, uh, internationally. Without this, CISIT or the U.S. government more broadly will not be able to engage uh, other than in a limited sense in activities with, with foreign counterparts. I think that CISIT should continue in every way possible to help facilitate the ability for U.S. scientists to interact with their foreign counterparts, deal with the barriers to collaboration, deal with issues such as intellectual property protection, data management, capacity building. 
I think that SISIT should place a special emphasis on ensuring that science and technology are key components in our nation's strategies for development and reduction of conflict in, in regions around the world. Mr. Chairman, Title V of the Foreign Relations Act calls on the Department of State to serve as the lead federal agency in developing the S&T agreements. I think that a close working relationship between a reconstituted CISIT and the Department of State is absolutely critical and that potentially co-chairmanship should be uh, considered for the committee uh, itself. Individually, these agreements may not rise to the level of, of uh, national significance, but collectively they are an important foreign policy uh, port, uh, portfolio uh, uh, collectively. Uh, finally, uh, Mr. Chairman, I believe that discovery, decision making, and development are all partners to the, the progress that we expect to achieve internationally. Diplomacy will be critical in that process. I think that CISIT should highlight the value, defend the resource commitment, and facilitate the actual exchange of international partnerships in the national interest. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Rock, and thank all the uh, witnesses for their testimony. Uh, at this point, we're going to move on to the uh, to members for questions. Uh, the chair is prerogative to go first, but I'm going to recognize myself for five minutes, but I'm going to turn the time over to uh, Dr. Baird, who has done so much work, I know, uh, on this issue. And uh, so I'm going to give five minutes to Dr. Baird. Chairman Lipinski, thank you very much. It's very gracious of you to do so, and thank you for holding this hearing. Dr. Ehlers has been a, a lead on this issue for many, many years, and I'm grateful for his work. Uh, also, uh, Mr. Carnahan, who stepped aside, has been working very diligently along with the Foreign Affairs Committee, on which he's also appointed. I see, in, in addition to our distinguished panel here, a number of folks who've been instrumental, Von Tarikian with the AAAS, and uh, colleagues from the State Department. We're glad to see you here as well. Uh, as you know, uh, I was so uh, committed to this, and I remain so committed to this, uh, though I'm on a different committee now. I restate on this one particularly to work with the chairman on this issue. And uh, uh, your, your, your testimony is encouraging, uh, that, that we are at least on the right track with SISA. The need for a global fund is well taken, uh, difficult in these budget times, but I think what we have to do is demonstrate the return that that would lead to in terms of diplomatic benefits, S&T developments, the, the four Ds basically mm -hmm. co co communicate that. One of my fundamental questions has always been, if you have an administration that is committed to this, as I, I, I certainly think this administration is committed to science. They've demonstrated that with, with public statements, with budgetary efforts, with both in the, in the uh, uh, Stimulus Act and in, in appointments that I think are very top flight appointments. Where do you see the role of, of in addition to SISIT, maybe the Global Fund, how do we, what else can we do to get state OSTP working together? Will SISIT, do you think it'll do the job or are there, there are other mechanisms to do that? Because that fundamental nexus where both look to each other uh, seems to me to be essential, that they, that they work together hand in glove and then how's our role in the legislative branch in bringing that about? I'll just throw that out there. And you were, I'm so privileged to have learned from you in the past. Educate us again and some more on this. Mm -hmm. I'll take a shot at part of that at least. Um, obviously, the representation on SISET is going to be very important. And the, the board recommended that each of the federal agencies appoint a senior official to be responsible for the international outreach aspects of their mission. Uh, presumably that official being also a member of CISED and being part involved in the coordination. Clearly, too, the representation from state and the involvement of state in this is absolutely vital to it. And I think that that area needs a good deal of consideration. And I know that uh, my companion here, Norm, has some very strong thoughts on that as well. Thank you. Just a, a comment on it. When I first got to the State Department, it was, it was late September 2000. And uh, I heard about this committee and thought, gee, what a terrific thing, because I had been way back in the Nixon administration. I had been in OST for four years. And so I realized that the vantage point that you have working out of the White House, but being in the State Department and, and, and the link to the foreign policy community, I think, wouldn't it be great I said, my deputy, Randy, Randy Reynolds is back here. I said, Andy, wouldn't it be great if we could chair that thing? Well, it turns out it was at the end, and then it wasn't renewed, and so it never happened. But I thought then, what a perfect instrument. And that's why I'm so thrilled that you folks are thinking of regenerating it. I think if you can come up with a, with a well-structured and a well-thought-out well, 
um, embodied. That is what the right people in CISAC uh, from the State Department, from the agencies, and particularly from a strong leader in OSTP, I think you've got a mechanism. I don't think you have to go beyond that. Then it's making that function and work well. I think the potential is tremendous. I really do. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, um, thank you for a uh, chance to comment again. And let me just take the opportunity uh, at this point to say how fortunate I think you are to have Congressman Baird remaining on the uh, committee with you. He's been a very active supporter of this, and it's a very, it's a very important issue, as you know. Um, my, my comment is, is only to say that um, the State Department and the um, um, uh, OSTP are leaders of a process, um, but they need to be able to look around them and see the participants in that process along with the leadership. And that means that we need to put some strength behind the federal agencies, the technical agencies themselves, that are the, 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 the practical expression, if you will, of this international science uh, collaboration. Um, by and large, the federal agencies are what I would call more sort of mission-oriented in terms of their science than discovery-oriented. And we need to have both of those participants in the international science collaboration enterprise, if, if you will. When we bring our federal agencies to be the primary vehicles for that, for that collaboration, what we're really doing is not so much aligning science priorities internationally as much as we are align, aligning mission priorities, which is good for us as a, as a government, and I think it serves our, our citizens. But at the same time, we need to be able to reach the discovery enterprise and bring the academic community more, more involved in this, in this process, and CISIT can help that to, uh, to happen. So if we get the resources behind the federal agencies and bring the academics in, I think we, we, we help tremendously in the process. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to also thank the, the committee staff for all their diligent work on this as well, and I think they've done a great job maintaining that continuity. I'm grateful for that, and thanks, thank you, all the witnesses. Thank you, Dr. Perry. We'll have an, have an opportunity to, uh, to come back uh, to you, Dr. Neuroyer, on that. Let me, at this time, let me uh, recognize uh, Dr. Ehlers for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Rock, you suggested that CISET uh, be co-chaired by OSTP and the Department of State. I'm curious uh, how the other members of the panel feel about that. Does that make sense to have a co-chairmanship there? I personally think it's a really good idea because, I don't know, even though you're only a few blocks from each other, there's when you're busy in your own house, you tend to stay in your house. And I think creating a co-chair. Now, one of the issues is that people have to get along with each other. And, and so it somewhat depends on who those people are that are the co-chairs and that they can really work together. And if they can't, it's a huge problem. But hopefully that the leadership will be such in, in both institutions that people who are compatible with each other can find each other and can come together. I really think it's not a bad idea at all. And Dr. Strauss? The uh, task force talked about various possibilities. We certainly agreed that we needed high-level involved representation from both the Department of State and OSTP, but chose not to make a specific recommendation in part for the very reasons that Norm points out that it's important that those, if, you, if you've got co-chairs, that they're really working closely together. Mr. Rock. Uh, th th thank you, uh, Dr. Ehlers, uh, and thank you for, for raising that particular point. Um, I raised it primarily because uh, we did, in fact, have this situation in one of the past incarnations of CISA. We did, in fact, have the, the co-chairmanship. I think the one thing that it did bring to the table was that it's very hard to select from among the 40-plus um, comprehensive S&T agreements, those which really rise to the level of highest foreign policy significance. And the State Department helped to guide the decision about what came to CISIT in terms of that level of priority. OSDP, in return, focused on the national R&D priorities of greatest significance internationally. So it tended to be, a, 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 I think, a pretty strong blend when we had it. Now, as you know, the bill does not do that now, but that's more for uh, our, our personal reasons here and getting the bill through rather than any item of substance. Uh, what, uh, if we didn't have co-chairmanship, uh, can you imagine a good interrelationship between the two and some other formal, formal arrangement or semi-formal arrangement? Any suggestions on that? Go ahead. 
Well, uh, again, I, I think um, one of the aspects that the uh, committee was probably most successful um, in in the past was to, um, to, to divide itself into subgroups uh, around technically significant issues. Um, I, I will you know, tell you uh, quite candidly, Congressman, that when we did the pandemic influenza working group, we did it only partly because that was an internationally significant issue. We also did it because it helped to elevate the visibility of CDC, give, it, give more recognition to its mandate, give greater potential for its resources, and to bring it into a closer working relationship with DOD. And that was a very valuable exercise just for that subgroup alone. I could see the State Department exercising responsibility over particular subgroups within the committee that would focus on foreign pol policy priorities to ensure that, that e even a, at a subgroup level, that we're, that we're attaching the greatest significance to the, to the items that are, that are uh, most important to our foreign policy as well as our national R&D goals. Subcommittee, sub, sub work, working group or subcommittee chairmanship is, is valuable as well. Okay, that, that's very useful. One, one last question on this score. Are you aware of, of uh, arrangements that other nations have made that we might use as a model for our relationship between state and science? This for anyone. No. Well, I'm, I'm not aware of any, any particular arrangement abroad. Another possibility would make the State Department a deputy chair of the committee. Now, again, maybe for reasons of your own, you don't want to do something like that, but that would at least establish state as a very important partner in the leadership process. But again, I think, I think it could happen without that, provided the people can get along and work well together. And also, if the real mission of this institution is broadly accepted, supported by the president, and strongly supported by the director of OSTP. I, I think that can make for a very powerful organization. Actually, I think those are the two most important factors. If you have the president's support and OSTP support, you're home free. You can do a lot. If you don't have it, it's, it's very, very difficult. The, um, I see my time just expired, so I'll yield back. Thank you, Dr. Ehlers. I think we'll have time uh, if, you have more, if you have more questions. Um, well, I'm going to, the chair will now recognize himself. I'll uh, play a little loose with the rules in terms of, uh, I guess we'll call this the second round of questions. Uh, I guess would officially be the way to say it. Um, or I'll, I'll call on Dr. Baird, who uh, I believe is going to yield then his five minutes to, uh, to me, so thank you. <laughs> okay, now we're, we're officially still on the first round of questions. Dr. Hani was not here today, but he, in his written testimony, he discussed the need for CISA to draw upon the research community broadly to identify and assess international opportunities. Uh, so I want to ask all of you, how might, how might CISA tap into universities, industry, and nonprofits with relevant expertise? And this is something that I'm particularly interested in. Uh, it seems in so many areas we do not do enough of that. Uh, I have a bias, having been a uh, professor before I was elected to, uh, to Congress, um, if I know the uh, university research and how important that is in the research community there, but also bringing in industry and nonprofits. We could do so much more in, in working together. So I want to throw that question out there. Yeah. Who would like to start? Mr. Rock? Uh, I, I'd be delighted to start being now a representative of the academic community after, uh, after 30 years in, in government. So uh, obviously I, I strongly support your, your motivation uh, in this regard to reach out more, more broadly. When we, when we look at collaboration internationally and the scientific community in other countries looks at us, um, they anticipate that they are building a relationship with the broad U.S. scientific enterprise. Uh, when they are, their only partners are the federal agencies, they aren't, as I said earlier, they aren't getting the full breadth of that opportunity. So I'm a strong supporter of getting, for, for the benefit of, of U.S. science as well as the international collaboration aspects, I'm a strong supporter of getting that reach as, as broad as possible. I might fine tune that by saying that if, this, if the representative for science cooperation only appears to be the State Department, it adds from the, from the foreign perspective a certain political dimension that does not always favor scientific relationships. And it's one of the reasons why 
I personally, um, as a person now sitting in academia, would like to see the National Science Foundation playing a more active role in, in helping to build those relationships because it will send the message internationally that it is a science-to-science -science relationship that we are, uh, that we are employing uh, in this regard. General. Thank you, Mr. Rocket. If, new writer? if one goes for something like the Global Science Fund model, and in a way my suggestion of putting money in the State Department, which indicates that it would be specifically for international cooperation, but particularly for science diplomacy initiatives, transferring a portion of that money to the National Science Foundation, I think that does achieve it because the National Science Foundation can work with NGOs, it can work with universities, and it could make grants to whatever institution is appropriate to participate in that cooperation. I think Gerald's suggestion is a very good one. If one does something slightly different with the Global Science Fund, they could, of course, call on any aspect of, of American S&T strength uh, to participate in the programs. Thank you. Dr. Strauss, do you have anything to add? Very briefly, uh, I'm, after spending virtually 50 years in higher education, I'm embarrassed that the task force didn't give more thought to the representation of that enormous wealth of scientific and engineering talent in the work of something like SciSet. I believe our oversight is prompted largely by our view that the National Science Foundation serves so well in that regard, and we presume it would be active, uh, very active, in the uh, SciSet initiative. Thank you. And I want to th throw something else out there, um, an opportunity to uh, uh, address an, an issue that, uh, that does come up. How would SISID complement and enhance rather than duplicate the international work of subject area committees, as such as the nanotechnology subcommittee and, and others? So what, what is the added, what's the addition rather than in the, you know, rather than just duplicating? The work of other committees. Who wants to start out here? The new writer? It, it just strikes me. I, I'm so preoccupied with the importance, I mean, the diplomatic value, the scientific value of international cooperation, that I think to count on uh, the work of these domestic committees, even if they are supposed to talk about international and supposed to talk about competition abroad and worry about our competitiveness, the fact is they end up focusing on the domestic issues and domestic problems and you will never get the attention I would like to see on the international relationship unless you have, you know, have some other mechanism and I think SISED is probably the right mechanism because you're bringing all of those groups together hopefully in a very effective way to concentrate on the international dimension, drawing on the domestic strengths to make it work. Mr. Rock? Uh, Mr. Chairman, science today is far more distributed and far more multidisciplinary than it has ever been in the past. My hope is that the NSTC will recognize that even in its issue-based committees and extend their, the, the concept of what that, quote, issue really represents to begin with. But the biggest challenge that we had historically in this regard was that the agencies with international mandates, and I mean specifically the State Department and USAID, um, tended to be the least participatory in the issue-based uh, committees themselves. So they really, they really did not exercise, even when the opportunity was identified to work internationally in the issue-based committee, it was never conveyed over to the, to the departments and the agencies that could carry that process forward. I think that, that SISIT needs to take that head on. They need to say, we, we understand the international dimensions. We know it under, from the level of the national priority and cross-cut all the way down to the individual federal agency's responsibilities and get behind supporting it. Thank you. Tanko, do you have any questions at this t time? Thank you. We're going to move on to the second round of questions, then I will recognize myself for five minutes and yield those five minutes to Dr. Dr. Baird. I'm enjoying this, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, ask a, a somewhat difficult pot uh, question, potentially. One of the challenges seems to be that if you look, uh, the, the broad question is going to be this. In, in addition to the SISED proposal and possibly uh, a Global Science Fund, 
what are other changes we need to make? And let me put a couple of potential issues out there. If you look at USAID and you talk to folks in the field, there tends to be this sort of, they've got the thing they do and that's what they do. And, and whether that's providing, often development assistance, sometimes emergency type relief, but it's, you know, feed people, get health care, clean the water, that kind of thing. This is a bit of a different kind of approach than, than the primary uh, infrastructure and, and, and custom maybe of USAID. At the same time, NSF, for their part, uh, have certain restrictions on what money can go overseas. They, they can't fund, it's my understanding, international researchers. What are your thoughts about how, how we can sort of impact maybe the culture of USAID to where they would see that, uh, that an investment in science diplomacy type activities is actually at least as meritorious uh, as the other thing, and conversely, what are your thoughts about should we make some changes to NSF's constrictor, uh, uh, strictures against foreign funding, or would the Global Science Fund, as you've envisioned it, take care of that? Those two questions. Let, let me uh, comment very briefly. The, um, the task force considered uh, these issues quite carefully, um, particularly recognizing the uh, very positive history of USAID in supporting science around the world. And it's, uh, we were mindful of the work that the, uh, the National Research Council had done several years ago in recommending some structural changes to try and uh, reinforce the science expertise within USAID to try to address this. And in thinking about this, uh, we, we recommended uh, increased attention in USAID and in the State Department to these issues. And then we're delighted uh, just, just a year ago now with the, uh, the NSF and the USAID entered into a memorandum of understanding, which I mentioned in my remarks, that uh, has dual funding with the NSF funding the, the domestic side and the USAID funding, funding the, uh, the uh, foreign partner side of partnerships on issues of, of common global concern. We're, we're really quite comfortable with that, and so far the this memorandum of understanding has been applied in several different uh, areas that seem to be producing good results, and we're anxious to see it uh, further advanced. I started working at NSF in 1963 in their, <clears throat> in their international operation, and I had a great dream for NSF at that time that we might turn, that, uh, turn, turn it into a, a major institution for international cooperation in science. And in a way, they've been a model for similar organizations throughout the world. So it's played a very important role. This recent agreement between AID and NSF, which was put together with, with the help of Nina Federoff at the State Department, I think really does a very good job in that regard if AID will buy into it and if, as AID emerges from the new administration, how it can really grab hold. The important thing about the recommendation that, that I made, that the money from the State Department go to NSF, but it would be different money from the standard NSF money and would be treated differently and, and hopefully legally can be handled differently and would not be restricted. On the other hand, our real model for this science cooperation is pretty much that the partners, the, each partners, uh, each partner funds his side of the bargain. I mean, it was just funny with India because I, I, I still chair this, the, the government's relationship with India, but we only have rupees that we can use in that program. And when the Indians say to me, you know, even the Slovenians for our cooperation are paying a million dollars on their side for their share of cooperation with us, and we're willing to put in tons of money on our side, why can't you find a few dollars on yours? Well, anyway, we struggle with that and have a solution, but not a very good one. So I think that, that kind of takes care of it. If you appropriate money to a place where it can be specifically for international activities, and then if they can transfer it to NSF, and NSF can use it effectively and not violate any strictures, I think that takes care of it. And this AID relationship is really quite exciting if that can be made to work and aid buys in. Part of the reason I ask the question is, is when one travels internationally, it's pretty common to meet scientists who were trained domestically here, got their PhD from major American universities, then went back. And oftentimes, whereas here, they may have had state-of-the-art access. And they go back home, and this whole career that they've worked their whole life just dead ends. They have no funding. They have no tools. 
And, and sometimes a fairly small amount of money from us could help keep them going. And they may be, in their home country, they may be the, the person. You know, here we may have umpteen hundred water purification scientists or something. They may be it in their country. And to, and to not give them support and collaboration and professional esprit de corps really could hurt us. And, and sometimes a small amount would not, I don't think, detract measurably from available U.S. funding, but might increase immeasurably the benefit internationally. Mr. Rock. Uh, thank you, Congressman. I, I, three quick points. Um, first of all, I, I want to support what, what has already been said. I think the value of the AID um, uh, NSF MOU is, is tremendous because it does uh, set some, some targets and direction. The second point is that, that with regard to the establishment of a global science fund, I think that uh, if it were, for example, exercised through, through NSF, that may perhaps be one of the most important elements of, of a need for legislation at all, to, to define those, those specific terms. But quite frankly, if those resources help to energize federal agencies and leverage their resources more actively, then the federal agencies can reach out internationally. If it helps leverage the U.S. academic community to engage more, they can reach out internationally. So it's a bridge, so to speak. My final point in that regard is you asked the question, how will AID's orientation be to something like this? I go back to my four Ds and say, if you can help AID understand that science plays a role in the decision-making process to help policymakers make objective decisions for governance in their, in their countries, that science plays a role in that, that's an extremely valuable tool that AID should be supporting. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, thanks for your indulgence. I'll yield back seven minutes when it's my turn. Uh, thank, you. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Baird. Now, uh, Chair, now recognize uh, Dr. Ayler for five minutes. In that case, I'll take the seven minutes. He just yielded. <laughs> yeah, this, is, this is our final round, so go ahead. <clears throat> no, I, I don't have much in the way of questions. But, Dr. Neurider, uh, you uh, made some very fairly strong and spirited statements in your testimony, and in particular one that's when something like uh, you wanted to prevent CISET from becoming another security gate focused on export control regimes or visa-like barriers to interaction with other countries. First question, was this uh, an issue during the Clinton administration when CISET was around? And uh, are you speaking from experience that this happened, or is it a fear that it might happen? Or both? <laughs> Well, just remember, I came to I, I came back to to uh, government seven years ago. No, it did not happen in the, in the Clinton administration. But the uh, security and protection and keeping us safe from everything and everybody around the world has been such a dominant theme for the last eight years. I just want to I just wanted to make the point that this must not happen with this organization. That cannot be a preoccupation, and I think. All of the language and all the rhetoric and all the words that have been used in connection with this activity and your hearing and, and your motivation and your motivation uh, all point in the direction of really fostering the international relationship and reaching out to the world. And I just wanted to make that point clear. Uh, no, I do not. It's certainly there's nothing been said either in the history of SISED or in connection with this hearing that suggests it's a danger. But I can tell you, the last seven years, that is the way so many things have gone. Yeah. Well, your message came through loud and clear. Thank you. And I appreciate that. Basically, you're saying you don't think you sh we should have uh, another co-chair from Homeland Security on this as well. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> OK. Hold on. Just, just one more point on that. Just on the, the report which the National Academies did on that subject, it's beyond Fortress America. It's very. I understand you've been briefed on that, but that's a very important report. It was chaired by, by Brent Scowcroft. And when he stood up, and I was on that committee, and when he stood up in one session and said, the system is broken, the visa system is broken, and the export control system is broken, and we've got to fix it, that's pretty strong rhetoric from that man. Yeah. Fine. <clears throat> Do you have any others? I, I don't have any further questions, so I'll yield back. Thank you, Dr. Ayler. Do you recognize that, Dr. Baird? My time to the chairman. I'm actually going to pass my time to Mr. Tonko because I, then I want to wrap, mm -hmm. go to Mr. Tonko, and then if no one else is uh, is here, I want to want to wrap up. So, okay. use the five minutes, of Dr. Mr. Tonko. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, 
Gentlemen, welcome. Um, being new, I've also heard in some circles that anecdotally uh, many foreign science ministers or organizations uh, look to start a conversation with the United States uh, agencies about potential partnerships, uh, but that because of the, uh, the depth and breadth of our portfolio of programs that are you know, placed amongst many agencies, it makes it very difficult. Um, my question is, can the Committee on International Science, Engineering, and, and Technology be helpful in, in serving as a point of contact that can then direct these potential partners to the right sources and maybe streamline uh, those actions? When, uh, when our task force was recommending the creation or the recreation of such a committee, that wasn't on our minds, but as you phrase it, it strikes me as an important issue, something we address within NSF uh, through our Office of Science and Engineering and in terms of coordinating the work of the, the various directorates across the international marketplace, and you could well see that uh, being an important function in CISET. Um, uh Thank you, Congressman. I, I guess I would, would exercise only one word of caution in, in this process, and that is that um, I do believe that, that the um, that Title V of the, the uh, Foreign uh, Authorization Act in 1979, which sets the, the, the terms for the State Department's role in implementing science and technology agreements, um, puts them as the lead uh, federal agency. My biggest concern historically with CISIT was that we didn't bury it in minutia. Um, there, are, there are many ministries of science and many um, higher councils of science and technology and many organizations that seek relationships with the United States. And I think our federal agencies have done a pretty good job in, in trying to balance those priorities against their own mission priorities. Um, I worry that we tax the federal agency sometimes too much and that if, if we put the pressure down on them from a, from any, um, a, a senior level executive branch um, committee, uh, that we, we make it very difficult for them to, uh, to, to be objective in the, in the relationships that they, that they try to build. Selectively, I think CISIT, selectively the OSTP director should lead, not, not, just, not just advise, but should lead those, um, those relationships. And it's up to the State Department and uh, with support of the federal agencies to work with CISIT to identify in which, those, in which um, relationships that leadership should be exerted. Mm -hmm. I, I think typically you'll see that a uh, uh, an initial contact, say, from a foreign science minister uh, often will come to an ambassador or come to the State Department. So that will tend to be the, the initial gate through which someone enters the U.S. And then I think it's up to, to a kind of a re reinvigorated, internationally oriented science community in the government to direct that inquiry in whatever way is appropriate. So I, I, I think to assign that specifically to CISED is probably something uh, I would not do. I would, I would count on the, the, the structures which emerge from this whole CISED complex to handle those inquiries, which will tend to come through the State Department gate. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of, and I think Dr. Newrider and Mr. Rock, you both have worked at the State Department, am I correct? Mm -hmm. How do you think the... Um, just how would the Office of Science and Technology Policy work the State Department into accepting the coordination and planning role that um, CISET could offer? How could they, how could they build the buy-in to that kind of partnership? Well, um, I, I just I, I would reiterate one point that, that I made earlier, which is that um, that CISET, OSTP, um, and the Department of State both would serve as leaders of a process where the actual execution, the practical expression of it, is coming from the federal agencies and from the broader U.S. science community. So we have to have a process that brings all of those players uh, into the room together. I think that the State Department, I would like to believe, from my 29 years associated with the, with the institution, I, I do think that they appreciate the value of science and technology in, in our foreign policy objectives. I think they need the tools 
to make sure that they can execute. And those tools come first and foremost from the, from the federal agencies and secondarily from some mechanism, which we are now discussing, to reach out more broadly into the U.S. science community. They are helped tremendously when OSTP endorses that objective. And it's okay with me if, if OSTP is endorsing it to advance our national R&D priorities at the same time. I don't think that's an inconsistency to advance the national R&D objectives and the foreign policy objectives at the same time. Generally speaking, there's no problem getting State Department buy-in to OSTP. We were always grateful when they paid attention to us, right? Okay. Is there a way to more cleverly or effectively construct that outcome in the language of this legislation? Uh, but, uh, Congressman, there, there's a painful way of doing it, speaking as someone from the, from the State Department side, and that is historically um, we had a process whereby uh, OSTP prepared a document which they delivered to Congress annually, the so-called Title V report, um, which was under the leadership of OSTP and was prepared by, by the State Department. Um, it is a very labor-intensive um, document. Um, I, I, I'm mindful of the fact that I have State Department colleagues behind me, and if I were to say at this moment <laughs> that we should reinstitute that, mm -hmm. that approach, I, I don't know if I could make it out of the room. But, but, but there, is a, there is an abbreviated... There's always the back door. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there is an abbreviated version of that annual reporting exercise that might provide some value uh, in, in ensuring that the State Department and OSTP are in, are in sync, and CISIT would play a valuable role in that. Thank you. Thank you for those uh, good questions, Tanko. And Jared would like to recognize now uh, Mr. Carnahan for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the panel. Um, I apologize for being out for a minute. I was had a Foreign Affairs Committee going on, and then, so it's a, a great overlap here between what we're doing with the uh, Foreign Affairs Committee and uh, the work of this committee. Um, I, I guess I've got a comment and a suggestion and a, and a question. Uh, my comment. We were, we, uh, it was great that, that uh, one of you mentioned uh, President Truman in the 1950s uh, convening this. So uh, from the being from the state of Missouri, I appreciate that. Uh, but the leadership really does come from the top down. And I'm also pleased that we have uh, a new president who has been very vocal in uh, promoting science, good science, and making science cool again, let's face it. Uh, so it's a, it's a great difference in, in the community. Um, I guess I, in my suggestion, uh, it's one of my personal missions here to eliminate from our vocabulary the use of the term soft power. Uh, I think it's counterintuitive. And I, I would much prefer and suggest uh, we use the term smart power uh, in terms of describing these other tools of diplomacy. Uh, enough of my lecturing, uh, but uh, on to my question. Um, when Secretary uh, Chu testified uh, before the full committee um, on R&D efforts in the Department of Energy, uh, he stated that one of the most promising sectors for international science cooperation was in uh, building R&D. And I just wanted to ask uh, the witnesses to comment on this potential uh, in particular or any other areas that you think uh, would be uh, top priorities for this type of uh, science uh, diplomacy engagement. Dr. Strauss, we'll start with you. I was sort of hiding there for a moment. <laughs> I, um, I certainly wouldn't dismiss the importance of uh, building engineering, um, both as a, uh, you know, a major source of, uh, of energy usage that is clearly a national and international issue. Uh, but I look at all the other uh, global science and engineering related problems and I wouldn't put the building issue at the front of those. I mean, I'm thinking now of natural disasters, epidemics, uh, sustainable energy writ large, uh, non-proliferation, and some of these other major global issues. So I, I don't mean to take exception with, the, um, with my colleague on that. Um, because I understand the importance of the building thing, but that wouldn't be at the top of my list. Okay. Dr. Newrider? I, I, I was focusing on your comment at the beginning on using, instead of soft power, smart power. 
And I wanted to add that we've actually changed power. Some, we've just come back from a, a science diplomacy trip to Syria, remarkable. Spent 90 minutes with the president of the country and talked about how maybe science, uh, a relationship in science can begin to change. Talked about working in, in water, energy, and agriculture and trying to find some things. We're trying to make that happen now. But we didn't like using power too much and when we're, when we're trying to relate to another country. So we came up with the word smart engagement, which I thought was an, another interesting way of going. I don't think I have, have really much to add on the, on the other point. I was thinking very much about your terminology, which I find very interesting. Great. I think we're on the same page on that one. Good. <laughs> Mr. Block. Uh, I, I would just make uh, one brief um, uh, comment on this, and that is that um, I, I do have some concerns when we focus our, our objectives on what appear to be sector-driven priorities. I think we should be focused on challenge-driven priorities uh, instead. So if one were to ask me today, you know, do I think that the energy sector is more important than the water sector, is more important than the health sector, I, I would say I, I simply can't draw that distinction. But I recognize the challenges for development. I recognize the challenges for quality of life or sustainability. And that's why science today has become so much more distributed in its scope and so much more, more multidisciplinary. When, when each year, when, um, when OSTP sets forward its, its national R&D priorities, the, the, the so-called cross-cuts, the emphasis is placed on the kinds of, of initiatives that will require crossing agency boundaries, really in a budget sense as much as anything else. And that's why you might get climate or you might get uh, critical infrastructures and national security and issues of that sort identified. But the fact is they're all focused on on challenges and not just on the sector itself. And I hope that we can start to begin thinking in those terms. Great, I appreciate that. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Carnahan. I want to uh, thank our witnesses for uh, testifying today. I think in the um, sort of second hearing of the subcommittee uh, this year, and I think this is another uh, great uh, opportunity that, that we've had. Testimony is excellent. I think the questions from the members were, were excellent. Uh, I, I liked a lot of um, what came out of this. I think we have, all of our witnesses and members have really done a good job of really getting out there why it's uh, important uh, for, uh, for CISA to, uh, to exist. Uh, I think this helped clear up a lot of questions that there, there may have been. Uh, of course, there's always more, much more work to be done. I like the uh, smart engagement I'm going to have to, I'm going to be using that from, from now on. Uh, re remember that and, and use it. Uh, Mr. Carnahan said the president has, m has made science cool again. I, I, I'm not certain about that yet, but uh, moving, in the right, moving in the right direction, certainly. I think that's something Dr. Ehlers likes to, uh, to talk about, that we need to, uh, to make science cool in, in, in some ways so, uh, so we get more people interested, more kids interested in going into uh, all the STEM fields. But I want to, want to thank, uh, thank our witnesses, and the record will remain open for two weeks for additional statements from the members and for answers to any follow-up questions the committee may ask the witnesses. And with that, the witnesses are excused, and the hearing is now adjourned. Good job.